as well. Um, I got the idea for this talk from a comment Emily Greenwood made in her presentation almost exactly a year ago. I recently rewatched her talk and the comment I remember isn't on the video, so it must be something that came up during the discussion afterward. Emily said then that a comparison of translations of the proem to Herodotus could be interesting as a means of looking at their unstated assumptions about ethnicity. I immediately wrote Tom and Yan saying I would be interested in doing something on that topic. And this paper today is the result, although of course it's undergone some changes in the intervening months. I want to say at the outset that this isn't actually a scholarly paper in the manner that most talks in this venue have been. What I'm doing is trying to identify some points to consider concerning the implications of various translational choices in Herodotus in our present rather terrible moment. I'm not offering any conclusions about which translations are best, and I'm not really breaking any new ground. I'm envisaging this paper as a catalyst for discussion rather than as a contribution to scholarship. I should also say that I realize and I apologize for the fact that my paper has a strong Anglophone and indeed North American bias. I did consider including some comments on translations into modern languages other than English, but I decided against it both for reasons of time and also because I'm not at all confident that I would recognize the semantic resonances of words and language other, languages other than English. The importance of that will become clear as I go on. Obviously, I can't cover every English translation of Herodotus, but I've chosen 10 examples that I think give a good range, as you've seen if you've looked at the handout, both chronologically and stylistically. The 1584 translation, probably by Barnaby Rich, Little Littlebury, 1709, Rawlinson, 1858, Godley, 1920, Salincourt, 1954, and its revisions by Byrne and Marincola, Green, 1987, Waterfield, 1998, Purvis, 2007, Mensch, 2014, and Holland, 2015. My subtitle refers to Herodotus in contentious times, specifically, I'm inviting us to think about issues involved in presenting Herodotus in translation in the present context of resurgent right-wing nationalist movements. I wrote most of this paper before, or worked on this paper mainly before the invasion of Ukraine, but obviously that's in all our minds now in this context. And also the present context includes, at least in the United States, attempts of white supremacist groups to harness the ancient world to their own agenda. For those of you who are interested in this extremely important though horrifying point, I recommend the website Pharos, doing justice to the classics. Um, I'm trying to figure out, uh, there we go. <laughs> Took me a moment to see how to advance my slide, sorry. Um, I recommend the website Pharos doing justice to the classics run by Curtis Dozier of Vassar, which documents many appropriations of classical history and literature to racist and misogynist causes. To take just one example from a distressingly long list, among the insurrectionists who stormed the American Capitol building on January 6, 2021, were some wearing Spartan helmets, as you can see there on the right, and others carrying a flag with the saying Molon Labe on it, attributed to Leonidas by Plutarch, not Herodotus, but very much part of the overall Sparta myth as the white nationalist movement in America has fashioned it. Now, I won't go into detail on this here beyond the main point that the ancient world in general and the presentation of the conflict between the Greeks and the Persians in particular are being co-opted by some of the most dangerous elements in our current political atmosphere. And I expect that similar misappropriations of ancient material can be found in other countries as well. Given this aspect of far-right propaganda, it behooves us all to be alert to and aware of ways in which the words used to translate Herodotus can, whatever the translator's intention, be seized upon and misused to further an agenda that, quite apart from what we may think of it independently, grossly distorts the content of Herodotus's original words. Now, obviously, we can't all retranslate Herodotus each time we set out to teach him. And equally obviously, we all have translations that we prefer to use for various reasons. 
but word choices in terms of phrase that even 20 years ago I considered innocuous or at the most needing a bit of explanation in class now strike, strike me as requiring more than just a passing mention. This is perhaps especially an issue in American colleges and universities where many courses on ancient history and literature read the sources entirely in translation. If one is teaching a seminar on Herodotus to students who read Greek, then questions about how to translate particular words, the resonance of particular words, arise organically from the work done in the classroom. I'm thinking more today about the difficulties we face with students who are reading Herodotus only in translation. And this may not be as much of an issue in other countries' educational systems. I don't know how large a presence classics in translation courses have elsewhere, and I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on that. Beyond the classroom, of course, there is a whole category of general readers who pick up a copy of Herodotus on their own and read entirely on their own. There, the translator's choice of words and any notes that may be included are the only guidance such readers will have to Herodotus's meaning. I've picked three examples of the sorts of translational pitfalls, as my title calls them, that I think we need to be cognizant of in our teaching especially. These are moving from the most straightforward to the most problematic, the description of the Colchians at 2.104.2 as melancroes kai ulotrikes, the account in one, one through five of the serial abductions of women and the crucial word barbaros. Let's start with the most straightforward example. Herodotus uses each of the words melancroes and ulotrikes only once in his description of the Colchians, which you see here. The etymology of each word is clear and obvious literal translations would be black skinned and woolly haired. And indeed most translators have gone for the obvious. The 1584 translation, probably by Rich, has in countenance alike black, in hair alike frizzled, where for Melancroes, the other translators break about even between black skinned and dark, dark, dark skinned, with swarthy showing up twice. Oops, sorry, stay with this slide. Um, but for Ulotriches, the etymologically literal translation woolly haired is by far the most common with only two examples, as you can see on the screen there of curly haired. Yet a look at the lexica may cause us at least a bit of unease here. For our first term, Powell, whom you can see down there on the right hand corner, just says swarthy. What about LSJ? For Belancros, we see black skinned, swarthy, of sunburnt persons. But the next definition for the parallel form melancholies notes that it is said of a hero's complexion, that's here, of a hero's complexion, and cites Odysseus 16.175. Now, uh, sorry, Odyssey 16.175. Now, this is in the passage where Athena calls Odysseus out from the swineherd's hut, tells him to identify himself to Telemachus, and beautifies him. She does quite a lot for him. She makes his clothes clean and shining. She makes him taller and more youthful. She firms up his jaws and blackens his beard and she makes him melancroes. So Athena darkens Odysseus' skin. Stanford's note on this line quotes Mikhail's translation which says his skin became bronzed. Perhaps the contrast here is that when Odysseus was disguised as an old beggar, his skin was pale and wan, and Athena restored the ruddy color of youth to his face. I'll leave this usage at that for the moment, but we'll return to Odysseus in just a bit. What do the lexica say about Ulothrix? It's a rare word. Powell says just curly haired. Um, LSJ says with crisp curly hair like Negroes. Under the related ulos, LSJ has the interesting entry, uli komai, you see there, crisp, close curling hair, and they cite Odysseus 6231. And guess what? This is another scene where Athena beautifies Odysseus, this time right after he is bathed on Scaria and now Sikaa is about to lead him to the city. She gives him ulos komas. LSJ also cite 23158 there, an exact repetition of the line in the scene where, once again, Athena beautifies Odysseus, this time just before Penelope sets him the test of the bed. But look at the next definition down here, where 
LSJ glosses ulotaton trichoma of the crisp woolly hair of the Negro. That's from Herodotus's description of the Ethiopians. It seems to me that there is a certain amount of question begging going on in LSJ's entries on these words. When the skin and hair are assumed to belong to a European, they are called dark or even sunburnt and close curling. When these attributes are assumed to belong to an African, they are called black and woolly, but the Greek words are the same in both instances. Interestingly, the Cambridge Greek lexicon does not fall into this implicit dichotomy. Here are its entries for the words in question. I would like to thank Yan for providing the scans of these entries since I don't actually have access to the Cambridge Greek lexicon myself. For Milan Cross, this lexicon says simply dark-skinned. Ulotrix is simply with thick curly hair and ulos is woolly or fleecy when applied to garments, but thick and curly or wavy when applied to human hair. Now, one could ask, why not stay close to the etymological root of ulotrix and use woolly haired as a translation in all instances? There, for American readers at least, we come face to face with the vicious racist rhetoric, rhetoric that has all too robust a history in American language. The use of the words wool and woolly to describe the hair of Africans is deeply embedded in racist propaganda. I won't besiege you with too many examples, but here are just a couple. In 1851, John Campbell published a vicious screed called Negro Mania, being an examination of the falsely assumed equality of the various races of men. Most of the book consists of reprinting passages from other writers, but it includes commentary of his own, of which I offer three samples to illustrate his use of the term woolly-headed. In the first passage, never at any given time from the most infinitely remote antiquity until now has there appeared a race of Negroes, that is men with woolly heads, flat noses, thick and protruding lips, who has ever emerged from a state of savagism or barbarism to even a demi-civilization. So there, as you see, woolly heads is the first characteristic he lists. The second passage is actually much longer than the selection I've included on the slide. Starting with a globalizing statement, Campbell goes on to list just about every aspect of culture he can think of and starts each one with what woolly headed so as I've included, what woolly-headed Homer's, Virgil's, Dante's, what woolly-headed Xenophon's, and on and on. I stopped transcribing after what woolly-headed Solon's, but the list continues for a full page more through rhetoric, science, technology, and exploration. Before ending, as I've quoted on the slide, have the woolly-headed races of men ever, and then a list of cultural accomplishments. In the third quotation on this slide, Campbell finally addresses Herodotus directly, quoting the description of the Colchians as a description of the Egyptians. He says that Herodotus traveled into Egypt. Sorry, I'm trying to get the pictures of you out of the way so I could, there we go. <laughs> he says Herodotus traveled into Egypt and says that the Egyptians were black in complexion and woolly headed. How far he is to be credited must be a question for the readers of this book to determine for themselves. But before I proceed to cite authority against the statement of Herodotus, I will give a couple of quotations from himself in order that a due estimate may be placed upon him. He then tries to undercut Herodotus's credibility by quoting the description of the crocodile and the passage about the relative thickness of Persian and Egyptian skulls and the reason for it. One more example, if you can stomach it. Um, Henry A. Weiss, who was governor of Virginia from 1855 to 1860 and presided over the execution of John Brown, referred to black people's hair as simply wool. All nature abhors vacuums and mongrels. So do conscientious conservative and constitution loving Whigs of Virginia. They can put up better with pure Africans, wool, flat nose, odor, Ebo shin, and gizzard foot, and all, better than they can bear that cross of the Caucasian and Cuffy, which you call a mulatto. Now, this isn't just a feature of American culture. Thackeray's Vanity Fair includes a minor character, Rhoda Swartz, a great heiress who is mixed race. Here is how George Osborne describes her to his beloved Amelia, or Emmy. 
You should have seen her dress for court, Emmy, Osborne cried, laughing. She came into my sister's to show it off. Diamonds and mahogany, my dear. Think what an advantageous contrast and the white feathers in her hair, I mean, in her wool. Obviously, the illustrator of Vanity Fair found this description amusing enough to make it the subject of one of the drawings accompanying the text, as you see on the right there. Just to make it completely clear that Thackeray is not inviting us to disapprove of George's racism, the culmination of comes with George defying his father's order to marry the heiress Miss Schwartz and announcing that he will instead marry his childhood sweetheart Amelia, whose father is bankrupt. Thackeray clearly intends us to approve of George's return to his loyal Amelia, but look at the terms in which he refuses to marry Miss Swartz. Marry that mulatto woman, George said, pulling up his shirt collars. I don't like the color, sir. Ask the black that sweeps opposite Fleet Market, sir. I'm not going to marry a hot and top Venus. Now, my linguistic examples are from, let's see, go back. My linguistic examples are from the 19th century, but it's worth noting that black people still encounter racist aggression concerning their hair today. There have been several cases in recent years in both the US and the UK of black children being expelled or threatened with expulsion from school for wearing their hair in its natural state. The most recent case I found in a Google search was one in Florida on the 1st of March of this year, so just over two weeks ago, where a 14-year-old, uh, sorry, a 12-year-old girl was told that her natural hair was, quote, a distraction, close quote, and was threatened with expulsion from her school, a private religious academy. So any terminology that seems to belittle black hair is deeply problematic. While the etymological calc woolly haired is the most obvious translation for Ulotrix, were I to venture a translation of Herodotus myself, I think I would go with thick curly hair or something along those lines. Moving on to my second text, test case, I'm turning from racially charged words to a passage that could easily be harnessed to modern misogynistic rhetoric. This is the widely discussed and highly contentious opening passage where Herodotus gives the version of Greek heroic myth that he says is offered by the Persian logioi. And I'm resisting the temptation to digress on how, to the, word, on how the word logioi should be translated. As we all know, the stories he recounts focus on the abductions and counter abductions of women from Greece and from Asia. The question of what exactly Herodotus is doing with this Persian version, why it is here at the very beginning of the histories, what its tone is, and whether or not he endorses the view put forward by these Persian logioi is obviously far beyond the scope of what I'm discussing today. My focus is on how translators' choices affect modern students' readings of this section. Herodotus uses the word harpage and the verb harpazdo throughout this passage. Here on the screen, you see the passage where I have bold faced every use of the words harpage and harpazdo in any form. One important point to note is that these are the only terms Herodotus uses to describe what happens to these women. He does not vary his vocabulary at all in this passage. Let's look at how translators have rendered these well-known terms. I won't have time to go through every usage in detail, obviously, so I will try to focus on some interesting highlights. First, in the opening description of Eo's story, you can see that most translators stress the meaning seize. Godly and greed, on the other hand, stress the carried off aspect. Interestingly, no one uses the term abduct or abduction here. Turning to Europa, we have our first usage of the term rape, a term I will discuss in some depth later, in Rich's 1584 text. Carried away and bore off both make their appearances, while our four most recent translators here opt for abducted. Next, Medea, a longer and more complex description. Rich has three different terms, carried away, trespasser, and again, rape. Littlebury has carried off violence and rape, and Rolison and Godley both also vary their terms. Selincourt leans towards abduction. Green goes for carrying off. Waterfield and Purvis consistently use abduction. Mensch chooses seize and seizure, and Holland switches between kidnapping and abduction. 
The terms used to describe Alexander's plan for obtaining a wife are startlingly various. We have steal and purvey, have a wife by the like means, procure a wife by violence, win himself a wife by ravishment, steal a wife for himself, wanted a wife by rape and robbery, steal himself a wife, abduct a wife, obtain a wife by abduction, and steal a wife. The final phrase of this passage, huto de harpasantos autu helenein, shows less variation, but there are a couple of striking choices, such as Rawlinson's, he made prize of Helen, and Holland's, the result was the rape of Helen. For the last one, I've included Holland's footnote. He says, this is by no means the only or the most accepted version of the origins of the Trojan War. The Greek word harpage meant literally seizure or abduction and was something of a euphemism. We'll return to the point about euphemism, but notice that Holland does not give the reader any hint at all that the word he here translates rape is the same word he elsewhere translates as abduction, kidnapping, and theft. The story of Helen continues with the Greeks call for reparations and suddenly rape becomes a word of choice for several of our translators. Look for instance at Rich, Littlebury, Godly, Selincourt, and Green. The four latest ones, however, lean towards abduction or in Holland's case, kidnapping. So Holland who just used rape to describe Paris's treatment of Helen and discussed that choice in a footnote does not repeat it here. Then we come to the famous phrase of the narrator, or perhaps of the Persian logioi, mechri men on tutu hapagas munas enai par alelon. As you can see, there is a very wide range of ways to render harpagas here. I would draw your attention particularly to rich, mutual pillage, green, only rape on both sides, and Holland's bout of competitive princess rustling. The Persian statement about the appropriate way to view such events is, of course, one of the most problematic sections of these accounts in the modern classroom, with its claim that the women themselves are willing participants in their own harpage, whatever word one uses to translate that term. Here again, our earlier translators use a wide variety of terms in this passage. For instance, Littlebury's violences of this nature, injuries those women and carried off, while the later translators lean towards abduction, although Mensch uses carrying off and carried off as well, and Holland supplements with stealing, stolen, and theft. And finally, in the coda about the Phoenician account, we have a wide range of terms for harpage, including rape, force, violence against her will, kidnapping, and abduction. While for the statement that Eo went ethelontain outain, we see willingly, voluntarily, of her own free will, of her own accord, and in Holland, opted to. So to lay this all out schematically, here is a slide showing how each of the translators translated Harpage and Harpazdo throughout our passage. You'll see there's a very wide range, both of the words chosen among all the translators and of how much variation each translator gives in his or her own work. Waterfield and Purvis are the most consistent each of them using abduction in almost every instance with only two exceptions in each. On the other end of the spectrum, we find that Rich and Rawlinson each use 10 different terms for Harpage and Harpazdo, while Holland uses nine. The variety of terms translators choose to translate these Greek words is quite striking. I understand, of course, that translators are attempting to avoid the boredom of repeating the same word, abduction, for instance, over and over. And certainly a case can be made for using kidnapping or seizure or even perhaps theft, if one accepts the implication that women are a form of property. But as my comments in passing have probably made clear already, I find the use of the term rape to translate harpage extremely troubling. In fact, I think its use distorts what Herodotus is saying in this passage. The problem, of course, is that traditionally rape in English could mean abduction. It presumably, in fact, that was its original meaning coming from Latin rapere. And of course, it is easy to see how the meaning sexual assault developed from the meaning abduction, since in most or at least many cases of abduction, the purpose and the end result were sexual assault. 
But the persistence of this now obsolete or at least um, unusual meaning in translation has led to an unfortunate overlap of meanings of the word rape. One can still see, for instance, in art museums, paintings labeled the rape of so-and-so, meaning the abduction. Here, for instance, is a painting of what is very clearly the abduction of Europa. We know, of course, that this abduction leads to her sexual violation, but what the painter represents here is the moment of abduction and obviously not the moment of sexual assault. Examples could, of course, be very easily multiplied with images that are familiar to us all of the rape, quote unquote, of Ganymede, as well as of various females. I'm laying this out at some length because I think it is a serious pitfall for talking about this passage in Herodotus with our students. In 35 years of teaching, I have found that modern American students are almost all of them entirely unaware of the use of rape to mean abduction. When they read and they're translated Herodotus about the rape of Helen, they take that to mean clearly, unambiguously, and only that Paris sexually assaulted Helen. I used Green's translation in class once, and I remember one young woman almost in tears at his statement that up to this point, it was only rape on both sides and others so furiously angry at what they thought Herodotus was saying by that sentence that it left them quite hostile towards Herodotus and colored their entire reading of the rest of the histories. I've just used the phrasing what they thought Herodotus was saying and I did so advisedly. However, we interpret the tone and import of the opening logos, I think it is at any rate clear that Herodotus is not here foregrounding violent sexual assault. The Phoenician coda at the end does indeed make contrast between Harpage and a young woman who is Ethelontane, but the contrast there is clearly between the idea that she was kidnapped and the idea that she embarked on the ship voluntarily. In other words, the point at issue is whether she left of her own accord, not whether she had sex of her own accord. In fact, of course, we're told that she left voluntarily because she had already had sex and become pregnant. But again, the contrast between Harpage and Ethelontane concerns the manner of her departure, not the consensual aspect of her sexual activity. There is indeed one passage in the histories where Herodotus does talk about sexual assault, rape in the sense that we use the word today, and that is at 833. Describing the Persian army's progress through Phocia, Herodotus mentions in passing that Kaitinas diokontes helon ton phokeon pros toisi orasi, kai gunaikas tinas diepteron misgomenoi hupopletheos. I won't go through all 10 translations for this, but I've given you a sample of four. Godly translates did certain women to death by the multitude of their violators. Selincourt has some women were raped successfully by, successively by so many Persian soldiers that they died. Green has some women too, they murdered with the multitude of those that raped them. And Holland offers gang raped the female captives so repeatedly that some of the women died. Clearly, when Herodotus wants to talk about violent sexual assault, he can make his meaning plain. And it is striking that three of these four translators, all four of whom use the term rape to mean abduction in the opening logos, here use it for this particularly horrific description of sexual assault. Can we, all feel, can we feel confident, however, that Harpage Harpazdo did not carry the double meaning abduction and sexual assault, paralleling the English usage? What did the lexica say about the meaning of these words? Let's start with LSJ again. Strikingly, their entry for Harpazdo does not include rape as a possible meaning. If you work your way through this entry, you will see that their definitions include snatch away, carry off, absolute, to be a robber, infinitive with blepe, to look thievish, passive, to have someone torn from one's arms, and then under the heading number two, seize hastily, snatch up, three, seize over power over master, four, seize adopt a legend, five, grasp with the senses, six, captivate ravish, seven, draw it by means of a vacuum. But when we turn to Harpage, we find as the very first definition, seizure, robbery, rape. And a note that this usage is first found in Solon and a quotation from Agamemnon, 
Oflon Harpagais Dikane, which is lost, found guilty of rape. Now this looks damning for my argument that rape is a translation, is a mistranslation of Harpage at first glance. But the Solon passage very clearly refers to the meaning robbery. They, they steal with rapaciousness, one from one source, one from another. If we look at the passage in question in Agamemnon, we find that it is part of the herald speech announcing the fall of Troy. Referring to Paris, the herald says that he has, quote, been found guilty of abduction and theft in Summerstein's translation. And look at the note. Probably the first term, harpage, strictly seizure, but capable of being applied to a consensual elopement, see especially Herodotus 142, refers to the taking of Helen and the second of the property. Herodotus 142, of course, is the Persian statement that women cannot be abducted unless they want to be. So it seems that in LSJ, we have a prime example of the old fashioned use of rape to mean abduction, not to mean sexual assault. Certainly, the Cambridge Greek lexicon seems to support this idea. While they do list rape of boys by men under meaning four of Harpage, I assume that PLB must be Polybius, and so this would record a usage much later than Herodotus. And in any case, it is striking that they do not cite Herodotus for the meaning rape, while they do cite him for sense three, abduction of a person. Their very detailed entry for Hapazdo does not include rape as a possible translation. What about Powell? Well, for Harpage, he lists plundering, robbery, and carrying off of women, so he does not offer rape as a possible translation for the noun. For the verb, he complicates matters by offering to ravish women, which, as my exasperated comment on the slide says, leads us to the question of what exactly ravish means. I don't have the time to try to unravel that here beyond just noting that it is often used, ravish is often used as a slightly more decorous synonym for rape and that like rape, it has the double meaning abduct and sexually assault. Powell's brief entry doesn't tell us which he means here or if he means both. To return to why this matters, my main point of concern is what modern students assume the word rape means. As I've already said, in my experience, they assume that it means invariably sexual assault. The usage of rape to mean abduction is not part of modern vocabulary. Apart from sexual assault, the only meaning of rape that my students had encountered was the metaphorical sense meaning violent destruction in expressions such as the rape of the wilderness by mining companies, that sort of thing. But that is clearly a development from the primary meaning of violent assault and does not tie into the sense abduction. So what then does the use of the term rape by so many of the translators we've seen in the opening Logos and Herodotus convey to modern students and presumably to general readers as well? Although none of the translators I surveyed use the term rape in the infamous sentence where the Persians say that women cannot undergo harpage unless they want it, still, the presence of the word rape in close proximity to that passage makes the whole logos seem to come all too close to the tired old misogynistic trope that women enjoy being raped and the parallel trope that no woman can possibly be raped if she resists. Again, it's quite clear to me that this is not what Herodotus is saying or even what Herodotus says that the Persians are saying. The idea that only willing women can be abducted is certainly bad enough and offensive enough and can lead to some tricky moments in classroom discussions, but it is not the same thing as saying that only willing women can be sexually assaulted. And again, it's worth remembering 833 where Herodotus describes sexual assault with chilling bluntness. If indeed, as many foremost scholars argue, the overall tone of the opening passage is humorous, and it is, as is often said, done tongue in cheek, then it becomes all the more crucial that our translations do not make it appear that this logos is endorsing rape jokes or a view of rape that considers it funny. I must move on to my final example, which is in some ways the most perplexing of all. Here I'm turning to a word that occurs not just in the proem, but throughout the work, indeed shapes the work as an entirety, 
That word is, of course, Barbaros. I find it exceptionally intimidating to try to discuss Barbaros here when several of you have done such important work on the concept. But again, I'm not so much discussing how the Barbaroi function in Herodotus's work as I am discussing what Anglophone readers assume that the obvious English translation barbarian must mean. The temptation to use the English derivative barbarian to translate barbaros is so strong that most translators do in fact yield to it. And yet I think it is a mistake to do so. No matter how many apotropaic footnotes we may add, and as we'll see in a minute, the most recent translators do add them to assure our readers that barbaros does not mean what we mean by barbarian, still it is all but impossible for modern Anglophone readers to exclude the normal resonances of barbarian from their minds when they see the word. Words come embedded in semantic fields, as we all know, and the semantic field of barbarian in modern English does not convey the heredity and meaning of that word. What do modern Anglophone readers understand by the term barbarian? Here, I find myself for the first time ever in my career citing Wikipedia as a source, because I think it gives us a good sense of the modern resonances of the word, probably a better sense than we would get from something such as the OED. Here is what Wikipedia says in the first paragraph of its article on the word barbarian. A barbarian or savage is someone who is perceived to be either uncivilized or primitive. The designation is usually applied as a generalization based on a popular stereotype. Barbarians can be members of any nation judged by some to be less civilized or orderly, but may also be part of a certain quote, primitive unquote cultural group such as nomads or social class such as bandits both within and outside one's own nation. Alternatively, they may instead be admired and romanticized as noble savages. In idiomatic or figurative usage, a barbarian may also be an individual reference to a brutal, cruel, warlike, and insensitive person. Judge from my experience of teaching, I think this is about right. Students assume that barbarian means uncivilized, primitive, and savage with undertones of brutality and cruelty. Now, very clearly, that is not what Herodotus means when he uses the term barbaroi to refer to the Persians. However xenophobic ancient Greeks may have been in general, I find it inconceivable that any Greek would have thought the Persians were uncivilized or primitive. Indeed, they were more likely to be characterized as overindulging in such aspects of civilization as riches and luxury. The resonance of cruelty may seem more applicable but even there, I think we need to be careful. Greek culture itself accepted a level of cruelty that is horrifying to modern sensibilities. And while Persian methods of execution, for instance, may have differed from Greek ones, I am not convinced that Herodotus consistently considered excessive or shocking cruelty a primary characteristic of all those whom he would designate as barbaroi. In short, the word barbaros simply does not map very well under what modern Anglophones mean by barbarian. What do our translators do with this word? Obviously, and you'll be glad to hear, I cannot do a word study of every use of the term barbaros in Herodotus, but let's just look at the programmatic opening sentence where Herodotus sets up the antithesis that will run throughout his work with his mention of erga megala tekaitomasta tamen heleisi tade barbaroisi apodechtenta. What do translators do with this? As you see here, almost all of them simply say Greeks and barbarians. Godly breaks the pattern with Greeks and foreigners and Waterfield opts for Greeks and non-Greeks. I want to call your attention in particular to the three versions of Selenkur that I've listed here. In the original 1954 edition of this translation, Selenkur did a very free version of the opening sentence. In this book, the result of my inquiries into history, I hope to do two things, to preserve the memory of the past by putting on record the astonishing achievements both of our own and the Asiatic peoples. Secondly, and more particularly, to show how the two races came into conflict. Notice our own and Asiatic peoples. It's worth noting that this translation would exclude the Ethiopians and the Egyptians, for instance, from the category of Barbaroi, and so is implicitly limiting the Ergamagala to Kaitomasta only to those done by Greeks. 
and Asiatic people. Also notice how he renders Epolemesan Aleloisi to show how the two races came into conflict. This reflects the use of race to mean what we would now be more likely to call ethnicity. No one writing today, I think, except perhaps the white supremacists identified by Pharos, would be likely to refer to Greeks and Persians as members of different races. And indeed, this phrasing disappeared with A.R. Burns' 1972 revision of Salincourt. Byrne preserves a good bit of Salincourt's wording, but he changes the Asiatic peoples to other peoples and replaces Selencourt's the two races with a simple they. In John Marincola's revision, Selencourt's wording is considerably altered. Achievements now translates Taganomena ex anthropon and Ergamagala Takaitomasta are more precisely rendered as great and marvelous deeds. Our own and other people's is gone, and instead we have some displayed by Greeks, some by barbarians, and the final clause moves away from Burns vague they to the two peoples. I have the 2003 imprint, I don't have the 1996 one. So I don't know if John had made all these revisions already in the 1996 version, or if he tweaked the opening sentence a bit for the second revised edition. If he's here today, maybe he can tell us about that. John does not include a note on the term Barbaros, but says in his introduction that by this term, quote, Herodotus means without prejudice, non-Greeks, close quote. The two most recent translators, Mensch and Holland, each do include a note on the term. Mensch takes very much the same position that I've outlined here. She says, Greek barbaros is largely a value neutral term in Herodotus, meaning only non-Greek rather than a primitive, stupid or warlike person. And then she cites 735.2 as an exception. That is the use of the terms barbara takai atastala to describe Xerxes' words to the Hellespont. Holland's note I find frustratingly ambiguous. He says, all non-Greeks were barbarians, a term originally signifying incomprehensible language, but later used derogatorily to indicate cultural inferiority. When he says later used derogatorily, what does he mean by later? If he means that Herodotus considers all barbaroi, including the Persians and the Egyptians, to be culturally inferior to the Greeks, I think he is mistaken, but that may not be what he in fact means. To recap, Almost all our translators use the obvious choice barbarian to translate barbaros. I'd like once again to look at the lexica and see if they agree that this is the appropriate choice. Here they are. First, LSJ. You'll see that they lean strongly towards non-Greek and foreign, as does Powell down there at the bottom. If we look at the Cambridge Greek lexicon, we find, and this surprised me, what I can only call a missed opportunity, since that lexicon translates barbaros consistently as barbarian without specifying what barbarian means. I am very hesitant to disagree with scholars of James Diggle's caliber, yet I persist in thinking that barbarian is at least a potentially misleading rendering of barbaros. And to circle back around to my opening points, it makes me uneasy because there is now so strong a thread among far-right rhetoric of casting the West, capital T, capital W, as the guardian of civilization and culture, and in particular of foregrounding the Persian Wars as a conflict between Western civilization and an external threat by, well, barbarians. I worry that the unproblematized use of the word barbarian in translations of Herodotus can unwittingly play into this narrative and can also mislead unwary first time readers into assuming a kind of greatest hits of Western civilization narrative that, that seriously distorts Herodotus's text. But here I run up against the obvious question of what term my ideal translation would use instead. And I have no easy answer. Foreigner is a possibility, but then we would have to use another word consistently for xenos. Rosaria Munson drew attention in Black Dove Speak to the importance of the passage at 9.11.2, where Herodotus notes that the Spartans called the Persians xenoi and comments xenus gar ekaleon tus barbarus. Xenoi is what they called the barbaroi. Salincourt in Marincola's revision 
translates this as strangers was the word they used for foreigners. That's a possibility if stranger is used consistently throughout the translation for xenos, at least when xenos is not referring to a formal guest friend. But this would elide the point that xenos can be used for other Greeks, while barbaros can refer only to non-Greeks. And I'm not at all sure that stranger carries quite the right resonance of person not native to my own polis that xenos has in Greek. Another possibility would be just to use non-Greek for Barbaros, since that is in fact the distinction Herodotus is making. As we have seen, this is what Waterfield does for the proem. But while that works, although rather inelegantly for the programmatic opening sentence, I imagine that it would become very awkward to try to plug in non-Greek for every usage of Barbaros and Herodotus. So I'm left at something of an impasse. Barbaros is obviously one of the most important words in the histories. Barbarian does not seem to me to be the right translation for it, but I am unsure what I would recommend in its place. To conclude, none of the points I've made here is new, and all of them are to some extent merely an indication of the truth of the old saying, traditore, traditore. But in our particularly contentious and dangerous age, I think we owe it to Herodotus to resist as strongly as we can any compliance, however inadvertent, with those who would harness his narrative for their own destructive purposes. As I warned at the beginning, I have not been able to offer any very helpful solutions here, and we are all to some extent bound to use the translations that in fact exist. I'll be interested to hear your thoughts about these issues, and indeed about our responsibilities overall as classics educators in this particular moment. Thank you.